salvation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. What more can He say than to you He hath said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled, fear not, I am with thee. You know, it's one thing to be sick, but just imagine how hard it would be to be sick and isolated and told by everyone you loved that you were being judged. If you lived in Jesus' day and got sick with leprosy, you could never touch a loved one again. You couldn't worship in the temple. You couldn't eat with your family. And if anyone ever tried to get near you, you were legally required to shout, unclean, stay away. Leprosy not only broke your body, but it also broke your spirit. The suffering went soul deep. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. Today we're going to witness Jesus doing the unthinkable. He reached out and touched a leper. And not only was his touch compassionate, but it brought healing. Dr. J. Vernon McGee tells us this radical and insightful story about the deep love of Jesus for people in need on today's message, When Jesus Touched the Leper. But before we begin, I'd like to welcome Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, to the studio. So welcome, Greg. Thanks, Steve. Now, you know today's sermon reminds me of all the stories that we've heard about the radical change and healing that happens when we come to Jesus Yeah, that's absolutely true, Steve. And when you look around the world in the areas that we minister, which is pretty much everywhere, but particularly what we would call the developing or the two-thirds world, life is just hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, millions and millions of people just literally scratch out a living, Steve. And along with that hard life often goes sickness, illness, and with poverty goes uh, social ostracism. So there are so many people who hear through the Bible and need that kind of hope and the kind of touch of Jesus in their lives. Right. And one part of the world where we get a lot of letters from people who are suffering is India. And here's one I'd like to read. I'm a regular listener of your Nepali program. I am blessed by the living word of God. I was sick for a long time and used to cry within myself that I would never be healed. I thank the Lord for your beautiful program and the truth about Jesus, our healer, that I've learned. As I listen, I gain encouragement and comfort for my broken heart. Eventually, I found that my thinking was wrong, and God's Word corrected me. Now I'm completely healed and happy with my life, but I never have forgotten the compassion of my Jesus, who used my illness to bring me to himself. Through our studies, I am building my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Steve, as you pointed out, we get a lot of letters like that, particularly from India. There is a tremendous amount of illness uh, because of many of the unsanitary conditions that people live in. Now, here's another letter from uh, New Jersey, from Mm. Richard. And it's a it's a long letter, but very, very worth our reading. He said, I have been riding the Bible bus for almost two years. After a year and a half of unemployment, the Lord gave me a new job. I called this year and a half my time in the valley. It was a difficult season that tested our faith and drained almost all of our financial reserves. However, with the new job, I thought I was ascending back to the mountaintop. However, the new job had a drawback. I often needed to work on Sundays. Hmm. I was delighted when I stumbled upon your program on AM 570 in New York. The spiritual food I have found through your ministry has helped to sustain me when regular church attendance has not been possible. You have been an oasis for me in a spiritual desert. In the years since my unemployment, I have come to realize that my time, quote, in the valley was nothing of the sort. God supplied my family's needs. I grew in my faith. Like Paul said, I learned to be content with abundance or with a little. I was just as secure in my unemployment as I am now with a job because my security is always found in Jesus Christ. That's beautiful. My deepest thanks to your ministry for what you have done for me by your obedience to Jesus. A more practical expression of my appreciation is this donation enclosed. God bless you. Hmm. Well, you already pointed it out, Greg. I think the key on that on that letter was, I was just as secure in my unemployment yeah. as I am now. Yeah. What a great theological and powerful and practical statement. Absolutely. Now, here's a third letter we have. This is from Germany. I received the manuscripts from Habakkuk in German. 
As I was busy reading them, I realized that there was still sin in my life. I repented on my knees in my study that same day. Since, I have found a new joy as I've never known. I called a family meeting with my children and grandchildren. After I had read the scripts of Habakkuk to my family, we all bowed and prayed for forgiveness of our sin. It was a time of crying and prayer. We also asked for forgiveness from each other. Dear brother, if you were here, you would have also cried with us to have the joy of restoration with our living God and each other. I write you this to praise God and Jesus for his saving power. Now with the peace and joy of Jesus in me, I greet you and wish you God's blessings. (laughs) You know, Steve, I often wish that we had the power to transport into people's living rooms and their homes and their dining room tables and hear the conversations they're having. And that's why these letters are just so wonderful, because they give us that experience. and That window into their lives. Yes, and I believe that if, if we had any idea of how broadly God's word is reaching into people's lives and how deeply. I mean, th- this is a story of a family being completely transformed. Right. And so what a joy it is that we get to be a part of a ministry like this. Right. Now, we do have some resources available if you are going through a difficult time. One of them is J. Vernon McGee on Comfort. It's available in our online store. Just go to ttb.org. Greg, why don't you pray as we begin this worship time in God's word and also for those who are suffering. Father, we do thank you that you loved us enough not only to send your own son to die on a cross for us, to pay the penalty for our sins and reconcile us to you, but you also brought us your word to bring comfort and real practical help when we are suffering. We do pray for the people that have written to us and the many others who haven't written but are suffering through trials in their lives, and we pray that through the Bible would be a comforting balm as we bring the healing word of God into people's lives. Thank you that we get to study your word now. We pray you'll open our hearts and minds to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible's Sunday Sermon with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. This morning we're speaking on the subject, When Jesus Healed a Leper. This miracle which he performed is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. That is, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record this miracle. And today we want to see the emphasis that each puts upon it, because each gospel places a particular emphasis upon the ministry of our Lord when he was here in the days of his flesh. In the gospel of Mark, we see the problem of the leper. In the Gospel of Luke, we see the person of the leper, and in the Gospel of Matthew, we see the purpose and power of Jesus. Now, first of all, we want to look at Mark's account, and we see there the problem of the leper. At the beginning of the ministry, of our Lord Jesus Christ, we find him performing this miracle. The opposition against our Lord in his own hometown of Nazareth was so intense and vehement that it forced him to move his headquarters down to Capernaum. And he continued on in Capernaum for the entire period of his earthly ministry as far as I can see, a city that he called into account and told them finally, if the mighty works that have been performed in you had been formed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have remained. But Capernaum was held responsible for what they had seen and what they had heard. Now, it was at the very beginning of his ministry here in Capernaum that a leper came to him, and Jesus healed him. Now, the problem here is the problem that the the leper created. He created a problem for the Lord Jesus. For our Lord told him, after he'd healed him, he says, you go and show yourself to the priests according to the law of Moses, and after you've done that, 
Then he says, I want you to remain silent and tell no one. And you want to know what the leper did? Did he obey the Lord Jesus? We read in verse 45 of chapter 1 of the Gospel of Mark, but he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in a desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Now this leper, instead of obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, he did the very opposite. He disobeyed him. When our Lord said to him, I want you to keep quiet, this man moved out, and we are told here, and Mark uses very striking and figurative language, and he says he, he blazed it abroad, and he says he published it. Now that, those are the two ways to get the word out. And there are no better ways than that. First of all, he published it. And that is something that, believe me, it gets the word out. We did not realize that until we had this message on the beatnik some time ago. And you may or may not know that we got on the news service all the way across the country, and we found out even on the front page of many of the uh, papers across the country. We've heard from places like Houston, Texas, Memphis, Chicago, Evansville, St. Louis, and San Francisco, and all up and down the country where people uh, heard it. And some of my friends in these places were a little incensed because actually we were not accurately quoted, which we expected. We do not expect a reporter to be able to get a spiritual message, and therefore we were not disturbed about that. So I wrote my friends and told them I didn't think that there was any use of considering it any farther other than this. The, the uh, United Press reporter who was here, he put in there a statement that has disturbed me, and it apparently got in every one of the accounts. And it went like this, the graying clergyman. And I, I said to them, I don't mind being misquoted, but I don't like being called a graying clergyman. And so, my friend, I found out that I can never live that down. I don't care what color I dye, that I'll always be a graying clergyman. It was published. And may I say to you this morning that that's one way of getting the word out, and uh, when it's published, you can't do anything about it after it's once been put in print. This leper published it, and then he blazed it abroad. And the word for blaze here actually means just a, a set a, a fire, a forest fire, if you please. And that attracts attention. If you want a witness in your neighborhood and you're finding that the folk don't listen to you, I can tell you how you can get the entire attention of your neighborhood. You set your house on fire and the whole neighborhood, and they'll come from blocks around because of, of, to blaze a thing attracts attention. All you have to do is to start a fire. I was speaking several years ago over at the First Baptist Church in Prescott, Arizona, and I was speaking on the palsied man, and I just in a very facetious manner, I said to the pastor there, a friend of mine, I turned to him at the first service on the first Sunday morning, and I said, now, if, if you want to have a crowd this week, the thing I suggest that you do is to set the church on fire, and we'll have a crowd. I, I didn't think he would do it, but that night uh, at the service, I was preaching, and he was I noticed he was a little nervous and fidgety, and of course that's not unusual when I preach, and so I didn't pay too much attention to it. Uh, finally he got up and he walked to the back, and then he came out and stood right by the side of me and he said, I'm sorry that we have to interrupt the service, but the church is on fire. And by that time a smoke was billowing over the pipes of the organ. And the people went out very orderly, but you could hear the sirens then, and the fire engines came up. And I didn't realize there were so many people in Prescott, Arizona. They were out. Oh, they came out that evening. 
And do you know that that meeting was on the back page of the paper on Saturday, but it was on the front page of the paper on, on uh, 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 Monday, and that church was packed out every night. And ever since then, when I go to hold meetings, I always have that as a condition, that the first night the pastor set the church on fire. That'll guarantee you getting a crowd, my beloved. And that's what this... That's what this man did here. He did the two best ways to draw attention. And Mark uses those words. He published it and he blazed it abroad so that everybody in Capernaum knew about it. And uh, as a result, why the crowds pushed in on our Lord. And when they pushed in on our Lord, it hindered his ministry. And you begin to discover now one of the reasons why he always requested those that he healed not to say anything about it. One of the reasons, I think, is that our Lord was always hampered, he was always hindered when the crowds pushed in upon him. And so he said to this man, you keep silent. He did not. And then our Lord's ministry was not primarily one of healing. He didn't come for that. He, the reason that he did heal was that it was the mark of his royalty. It was the sign of his sovereignty. It was the credentials of his claim to being the Messiah. For the prophets had said that when he comes, the lame will leap. And the blind will have their eyes open. And when John the Baptist was in prison and puzzled, and he sent his disciples to the Lord, and he said to him, Are you the one coming, or do we wait for another? Our Lord said, You go back and tell John what you've seen. You have seen the lame walk. You've seen the blind. You've seen the leper heal. That's the mark of the Messiah. And that's the reason that he did it, my beloved. And that's the reason that you have him performing the miracles that he did. It was not primarily that he came either as a thaumaturgist, a miracle worker, or did he come as a healer, for that was not the important thing. And after his resurrection from the dead, when he was here for 40 days, moved in and out among men, you never find him healing anyone. That ministry now is past for him. The important thing now for him is that he heals the souls of man and saves them for time and for eternity. Now, I pass to the next gospel writer, and we look at the person of the leper, and I turn to Dr. Luke. For Dr. Luke was a medical doctor. He uses more medical terms than Hippocrates, the founder of medicine. And he injects in his account something you will not find in either one of the other two gospel records. In verse 12 of chapter 5, it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. And that's the expression I seize on. Dr. Luke alone uses that. He's full of leprosy. Only Dr. Luke calls our attention to it. And the reason that he does, he's using here a technical and medical terminology. In other words, if Luke were writing today, he would use the modern medical terminology. He would call it elephantiasis gricorum. And when you have that, it'll cost you more. I found out that when the doctor gives it a name like that, believe me, brother, when you get the bill, it's in the bill. And uh, that's the modern name for it, Elephantiasis Gricorum. But Dr. Luke in his day says he's full of leprosy. Now, leprosy in the Bible is never lab labeled as being incurable. That's a misnomer. For if you notice this morning the language that I read, 
in the fourteenth chapter of Leviticus, the third verse, And the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. The Old Testament recognized the fact that a man could be healed of leprosy. It was not incurable. It was in that day as it is today in three stages. That is the first stage of leprosy. The first symptoms are there's a lethargy and a lassitude that may go on for several months, even for several years. The second stage of leprosy is when the skin and mucous membranes are affected. Then the nerves are affected and a numbness comes over part of the body. That's the second stage. And then there is the third stage, and that's the sloughing off of the flesh. We have seen beggars that the missionaries have brought the pictures back with their faces practically eaten away and sometimes hands and arms eaten off. That's the last stage of leprosy. And Dr. Luke is saying he's full of leprosy. This man was in the last stages, and the last stage was incurable. First stage was not. It's interesting that what leprosy was and is to the Orient, cancer is to the Western world today. If today the doctor gets the cancer in its first stages, he can arrest it and heal it. If it has progressed to a certain degree, there's nothing that he can do. There are the last stages of cancer. And so, my beloved, this man was in the last stages of leprosy. He was absolutely incurable, and only Dr. Luke tells us that. Now, leprosy in the Scripture is a picture of sin. In the book of Leviticus, which is the great book of worship, this puzzled me for years. Right in the center of this most remarkable book of the Bible, and there are Bible expositors of the past who have said the book of Leviticus is the most important book in the Bible. May I say to you that when you come to a knowledge of this book here, you see its, its significance even to this hour. But right in the center of this great book on worship, there is a, an enlarged section on leprosy. And I wondered why. Chapters 13, 14, and 15, all about leprosy, right in the middle of the great book on worship. And why in the world would Moses put it there? Well, leprosy is a picture of sin, and you can't worship God with sin on your life. The leprosy of sin must be dealt with before man can come to God. Leprosy is in the blood. Sin is in our blood. We have a sin nature. Listen to this description. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, when a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, a bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of the sons the priest, and the priest shall look on the plague in the skin of the flesh, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of the flesh. It's a plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. Leprosy therefore shut man out from God. Sin shuts man out from God, and it's in the blood, it's in our nature, it's in the web and woof of our being. Leprosy was repulsive and loathsome. And believe me, my friend, so is sin. We are living in a day when sin is being gloriously housed, steam-heated, neon-lighted, and being made very attractive with music in the background. But sin today to God is still as loathsome 
and it's a stench in his nostrils. And if you think he's changed his opinion when you come to the New Testament, listen to this, for the great physician now takes mankind and looks at him, and this is the last analysis that God makes of mankind in the epistle to the Romans under sin. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They've used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips. What a picture today of man. Man with a throat like an open sepulcher with putrefying flesh. Man with the poison, poison of asp, a poison more deadly than any reptile today. Read in the paper this week of this boy out here in Buena Park bitten by a snake more poisonous than any rattler, ten times more poisonous, and they're flying in serum in order that they might save his life. My friend, underneath your tongue this morning, there is a poison ten thousand times more deadly than that. There is a poison that'll wreck men's reputation. There is a poison that'll drag men and women down. There is a poison that will gossip and wreck and ruin churches and hearts and homes today. It's under your lips, and it's under my lips today. And God looks down and sees us as cancerous and as leprous in his sight. This world in which we live is a great leper colony of sin, as God looks at it today. And this leper came to Jesus. Dr. Luke tells us this. In fact, all the gospel writers, the synoptics tell us this, that Jesus reached forth his hand and touched him. He touched him. May I say to you, there's a psychological healing here that's tremendous. Christmas Evans, the great evangelist of years ago from the British Isles, used to tell his story something like this. He said one day Mr. Leper had come in from the field from plowing. Ms. Leper had fixed the dinner, and as he's eating, he says to her, Oh, the palm of my hand is so sore. And she says, after dinner, I'll fix a poultice and put on it. And after dinner, she puts a poultice on it. And all during the night, he feels the pains going up his arm. The next morning, she says to him, is it better? And he said, no, it, it's not better. She takes it off, and by this time, it's all puffed up. But he says, I've got to go into the fields. I'm behind in my plowing. And he went out and stayed all day. And he came in, and that evening that hand was almost limp as it was hanging at his side and now all swollen up. She said, you can't go back tomorrow. And that night she doctored it, and he could not sleep. By the third day they suspected something, and finally they had to go to the priest. The priest looked at it and he said, I'll put you in quarantine. He put him in quarantine. Fourteen days went by and by this time it has spread. It's down deep. It's ugly. It's angry. And now he says, you're a leper. You'll have to leave. Well, he said, let me go back and tell my family goodbye. I have their several precious little children. I won't tell them goodbye. The priest said, I'm sorry, but you can never touch them again, nor can they ever touch you again. So this leper goes out to the edge of town, and they come out a certain distance, and he looks longing at his family. Never again can he touch them. Never again will he feel those little chubby arms around his neck. Years go by, and he comes to the last stages. During that interval, he's watched his family grow up. They've come out and brought food and left it, and then they retire. And finally, he misses one one day, and his wife says, Well, John married. And the daughter, Sarah, she's married now, and she doesn't come anymore. 
And his wife, he can see, is getting old, and he's getting old, but leprosy is about to destroy him, and one day he hears about Jesus. And when he hears about Jesus, he immediately breaks every rule and regulation. He moves in through the crowd and comes to him, and the Lord Jesus reached forth his hand and touched him. The first time in years he'd been touched. You have no notion what that meant to that man. He was touched. Now he's healed. Let's come to the last, briefly. The purpose and power of Jesus. And I turn back now to the Gospel of Matthew. After the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord came down from the Mount, and Matthew gathered together a series of miracles and put them here for a definite purpose. He put them here to reveal the fact that the one who gave the Sermon on the Mount now has power to enforce it. For you see, Matthew presents him as king, and the Sermon on the Mount is not enforced today. There's no one here to enforce it. And anybody tells you he's living with a Sermon on the Mount today, he's deceiving himself as well as trying to deceive others. You are not living by the Sermon on the Mount. It's not even in effect today. There'll be someone here someday with the power to enforce it. That'll be a great day for this world. The question is, was the one who yonder on top of the amount enunciated an ethic, will he be able to supply the dynamic? Will the one who propounded the principle on top of the mountain, can he come down to the valley and provide the power? Matthew brought together these miracles they, are, they fit into different realms, the physical, the material, the spiritual. Every realm of life, showing that he had power in all realms. And the first is in the power of the physical. For the first miracle he gives is the miracle of the leper. Immediately when our Lord came down from the mountain, this leper was waiting for him. He made his way through the crowd. And when he came to the Lord Jesus, he says, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He didn't say, Can you make me clean? He says, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king. And as the king, it's not a question of can you. The question is, will you? And he's put this, my friend, upon the will of God. He put it upon the sovereignty of Almighty God. And the Lord Jesus responded to that man's faith. And when this man came and said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will. And reached forth his hand and touched him. And he's healed. There's a great principle here. It's not his will that any should perish. Sin today is like a great plague of leprosy. All today are suffering from it. All are sick. And it has the power to destroy man. It can break fellowship with God and man. But there is today the great physician, the great physician who has a remedy, and that remedy is his death yonder upon the cross where he offers this morning forgiveness of sins, fellowship with God restored, and fellowship with man. He healed him. Do you notice how in the Old Testament, that's one of the strangest rituals that you have in the Old Testament. When the leper was to be healed, you had to take two birds. One bird is slain. The other bird's dipped into the blood and turned loose. 
That speaks of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's to be slain in an earthen vessel. That speaks of his humanity. He did not take our sin. He only took our humanity. And he came down to this earth in an earthen vessel. And in that earthen vessel he was slain. He paid the penalty for our sin. They had to have a second bird, the bird to represent his resurrection. And that bird, touched with the blood, flies away. And he, having paid the penalty for our sins, he rose from the dead. It was done over running water. This was done by the Holy Spirit of God. And today there is a Savior who can heal the leprosy of sin. And before today you and I can even touch another person. And that's the fallacy of this big brother stuff today, this patting on the back and going down with sinners and having fellowship with every sinner. And when you hear some girl say today, well, I'm going with him, I know he's unsaved, but uh, I'm trying to win him for the Lord. My friend, today only Jesus Christ can touch a leper. You dare not. When you and I touch a leper, healing never leaves us. But leprosy leaves the leper and comes on us. You can't touch the leper, but he can. He touched the leper and he brought healing. Only Jesus today can touch him. And my friend this morning, if you on the inside feel unclean, if you on the inside today feel like you've got the leprosy of sin, and you come to him by faith, for that was all applied by hyssop, In the cleansing, that hyssop represents faith, an act of faith. If you can come as this leper did and say, can you? No, if thou wilt, and he will today, for it's not his will that any should perish. And the only reason today you're not cleansed and healed is you haven't come to him. When you come, he touches you and he brings healing. And my friend, if he's touched you, He'll make you right, and he'll make you honest, and he'll make you straightforward, and he'll make you sincere. When people tell me today they've been touched and their lives don't show it, but somebody says they've got a testimony. The man who, for the petroleum industry today, is their top man in that he goes about all over this country looking at their operation from the top, pointing out their problems, pointing up the problems, and then offering the solution. This man has one of the highest IQs of any man in America today. Mentally, he's alert. To be in his presence, you hear the wheels turning all the time. He's alive. This man made the statement, and he's for he's a wonderful Christian. He said, I can get up and I can use all of the Christian cliches. I can talk about being born again. I can talk about being filled with the Spirit. And at the same time, I can be giving you the most damnable heresy in the world. Oh, I know a lot of folk got the language today, but they got leprosy. They haven't been healed, because when he heals, he touches, and when he touches, you won't be a compromising, conniving, and critical Christian. Do you have internal cancer today? Sin will break fellowship. It'll mar the unity. The long as the leper is in the camp and in the church, He'll break the unity. He has to be put out of the camp. I close with this. 
I was taken to Fort Worth from Wichita Falls the other morning by a man whose father is probably the outstanding oil and real estate man in that entire area. He told me a story, a remarkable story, about a mutual friend, a man I had met there, and I wondered about his story. A wealthy man living in a home that costs $185,000. But his wife had already seen the lawyer, and they were getting ready for divorce. He was wrong with everybody. He told me how this man, first of all, his wife, came in contact with a friend at the country club who had just recently come to Christ, and how this friend told her about how the Lord Jesus could touch you and heal you on the inside. And she was touched and healed and marvelously saved. She went home to win her husband. But he was probably one of the most cantankerous men you've ever seen. He was home, sick with the flu, lying in bed, and she went in to try to talk with him. And, well, it ended up as it always had, with a throwing battle, and she forgot that she was a new creature in Christ. And she took the Bible and threw it at him, and he warded it off with his arm. It dropped on the bed, and he said to her, That's a funny way to get religion. And she went out to go to her friend and tell her how she'd failed. And when she got to her friend, they got out on their knees. He was at home, and he started. He looked over and saw that Bible. He'd never read one before in his life. He started back in the book of Revelation. He did it backwards. He did everything backwards. He read he read Revelation first, and he got interested, thought it was a funny book. Then he read Jude. Then he read 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. Then he read Second Peter, third, uh, First Peter. Then he read James, read Hebrews. Came over and read Philemon, read Titus, Second Timothy, First Timothy. Then read Philippians, Colossians, and then Ephesians, Galatians, Romans, Acts, John. He's going backwards. But when he got to John, he crawled out of the bed. Late that night, in fact, it was the next morning, and got on his knees and accepted Christ. The great physician had healed him. When I met him, he was healed. What a change. Jesus Christ today touches those with the leprosy of sin, and he heals them as he touched you. Shall we pray? As we bow our heads this morning briefly in this closing prayer, I'm wondering if you're here today, you're not sure whether he's touched you or not. And some of us do well to be uncertain about it. Because when he touches, he heals. Has Jesus touched your life? Would you like him to? Whatever the condition of your life, he reaches out to you in love. So turn to him today. And can I ask those who are walking with Jesus to pray for those who are listening, whose hearts and lives are broken? Pray that God's word reaches them today with comfort, grace, and peace. Today's sermon, When Jesus Touched the Leper, is available on a single CD or as part of a 20-sermon MP3 series called Tracing the Steps of Jesus in the Days of His Flesh. Another resource on the life and ministry of Jesus is Dr. McGee's book, Jesus, the Centerpiece of Scripture, and the book that we mentioned earlier, J. Vernon McGee on Comfort. You'll find all these resources in the online store at ttb.org. Now, for all of us at Through the Bible, I'm Steve Schwetz, and we're praying that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus made it to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, who are being used by God 
to take the whole word to the whole world.